I've made a video in the past about how to make the most simple ray trace in Blender and now we are going to do the same but we are not going to intersect these white spheres. Instead we are going to intersect this 3D grid. So in Blender let's create a plane. This will be our screen. And in the shade editor we can give it a new material. Let's switch to the material preview mode up here. And in the render settings we could also disable the color management. If we now place a geometry node, here we basically get a coordinate system. So every pixel on our screen is displaying the 3D coordinates of that point in 3D space. So XYZ coordinates get displayed as red, green and blue. We can use a vector mass node to uh, scale this, so we multiply or scale the entire coordinate system. So what I want to do first is, from this coordinate system, I want to create a 2D grid. So what we can do is, with another vector mass node, we can use the fraction option. So this takes the fractional part of the coordinate system, so it always repeats between 0 and 1. Next we could uh, shift this coordinate system by 0 0.5, so we subtract 0 0.5. We don't change the set component because we are only working in 2D, so we only care about X and Y. So now the center of each of these uh, small cells has the coordinates 0, 0, so it's black. Here the coordinates are negative and here they are positive. So what we can do is take the absolute value of them. So now also the negative coordinates are positive. With a separate XYZ node, we can split this vector into its three components. So these blue dots contain three individual coordinates, three values. So we have the X component and the Y component. So with a mass node, we can do a comparison. We can test if this gradient is less than a certain number. So we created horizontal lines and we can change the thickness by changing this value. And we can repeat the same thing for the x-coordinate. And now we have vertical lines. Now to combine these two, we can just add them together. And we should also clamp this value, so it stays in the range between 0 and 1. Now let's add a value node, so we can control this with one value. So now we have created a mask for a grid. So we could group all this and call this our grid mask. So let's rename the inputs. So we give it a UV coordinate system and we get back a mask. All right, so the next thing is we want to take this into the third dimension. So what we could do is we could ray trace a flat floor plane and then we could apply this grid basically as a texture. So let's first set up a simple camera system for our ray tracer. I'm going to use the same that I used in the first ray tracing video. So this combine XYZ node will be our ray origin, the position of our camera in 3D space. We work in a coordinate system that has the Y axis as the up direction. So if we want to move the camera up, we increase the Y value. Alright, so here we generate our ray with a starting point and a ray direction. Okay, so now we want to intersect our ray with a floor plane. So if we look from the side, this is our camera and let's say we shoot a ray in this direction. And we now we want to find the distance how far the ray can travel until it intersects the floor plane. So this is our ray origin and this is the ray direction. And we want to find out this distance d. What we know is the distance how far our ray origin is away from the plane, so how far it is up. And we also have the coordinates of our ray direction vector. So we know this length here, which is the y component of the ray direction vector. And we also know this length here, the y component of the ray origin. And we also know that our ray direction vector is a unit vector, so it's normalized, so it has the length 1. So this small arrow here has the length 1. And now we have here a triangle, which has the same proportions as this larger triangle here. So we know that 1 divided by this length here is the same as d divided by this larger length. Which means that the distance d is the y component of the ray origin divided by the y component 
of the ray direction. So we can implement this in Blender. We can use a separate XYZ node to access the three components of the vectors. We could rename these two to ray origin and this to ray direction. We have to divide the y component of the ray origin by the y component of the ray direction. If we display this, we get this. We should first move the camera down a bit. And it looks like our image is upside down. This is because our ray direction in this case is actually negative. So we have to flip the sign. So, so we have to divide by the negative y component of the ray direction. So let's just multiply it by negative 1. So what we are currently displaying as the brightness is the distance d. So here at the bottom, the distance from the camera to the plane is a lot smaller. This would be like here if we would look down. The distance d would be a lot smaller than if we look far into the distance. And if we move up and down, the values change as they should. Now, of course, we have a problem. The sky is black. Because if we are shooting a ray in a way that can never intersect the floor plane, obviously we will not get back what we want. So all the pixels above the horizon should be actually infinite because the ray travels infinitely far. Instead of infinite, we can use just a high number like 1000. So now we want to replace this distance value with 1000 if the ray is hitting the sky. So we can use a mix RGB node, which is actually for colors, but we can also use it for numbers. So we don't have to create our own node. We want to mix between our distance and the infinity value based on a certain mask. And to get a mask, we can just use another mass node with the less than option. So if this distance is negative, so if it's less than zero, and we can now mix between these two values based on this mask. And here we go, we have our final distance of the plane. So if we move around, it works great, even if we go below the plane. So we have now intersected an infinite floor plane and we can put this all into its own node. So let's group this. Uh, the output should be a float and let's call this our distance and we can call this node intersect floor. Okay, next we want to apply a texture to this plane and we are going to use our grid mask for this. So we have to first get the coordinate system of that plane. So every object has a certain UV coordinate system which describes the position where we are on the surface. In the case of our floor plane, we can just calculate the hit point. We use a vector mass node. We start at the ray origin. We go in the direction of the ray direction vector. And then we multiply or scale this vector by our distance. So this here is our hit point. And if we display this, if you move the camera around, you can already see this coordinate grid on the bottom. So we have now our hit point coordinates. And if we use a separate XYZ node, we can take a look at the X coordinate. So our X coordinate goes in this direction along the surface and our Z component goes in the direction perpendicular to it. So the surface UV coordinates, which are two dimensional, so the x coordinate is the x coordinate and the z coordinate is the y coordinate. So here we construct the uv coordinate system of that surface. And once we have this uv coordinate system, we can just plug it in into our grid mask. And here we go, we have a grid. We want to create a 3D grid, not just a flat 2D grid. So we want to get the intersection distance to the grid. So all the black parts now should be infinite. The ray should travel infinitely long and not hit the grid. And all the white parts should return the distance to this hit point. So we have to do the same again as before. We want to return the distance if we hit the grid. And we want to return the value 1000 if it's black. So we have to mix between these values based on our new mask, on the grid mask. And if we display this, well, we have to move down a little bit. So now we have the distance to the plane and we also have the distance to the grid. We could put this all into its own group. So two inputs and one output, the distance. And this node group we could call intersect grid plane. We can just multiply our distance 
so the value is lower and we can see it better. And if we clamp the value, it looks a bit better. We could add a value that defines the height, how high the plane is. So inside the intersect floor node, we could add a mass node here and we subtract. So with this value, we can control the height on the y axis. And we can also just make this an input and call this our position. We can feed this through again. So we also have it here outside. Now, if we want to add multiple grid planes, we just duplicate our node and we could move this plane minus one. So to combine two objects, we just take the minimum distance, set it to minimum. So this will now always return the closest object. So let's add a value node. And this is our distance if our scene is empty. So if no objects are in the scene, the ray always travels 1000 units. Let's call this our distance. And now we want to pass this through this node. So let's create an input at the top and call it distance. And we can hide the value. So now we have an input. We can feed this in here. And now inside this node, we want to add this plane to the empty scene. So we take the minimum inside the node. So let's go inside the node. We take the minimum between the previous distance and our new distance. And then we output this again. So now we can easily add more planes by just passing this distance value through. So if we now move up at a certain point, we move above the grid. To prevent this from happening, what we can do is, if this is our grid, and here's our ray origin, if the camera moves outside, it teleports back in from the other side. We can do this by also using the fraction node. So if we have a coordinate system here, we have zero, here we have one. If the ray origin moves to, let's say, 1.2, we take the fractional part, so only the 0.2, and we land here at 0.2. So let's do this. Let's add a vector mass node and set this to fraction. So now if we move up and up and up and up, we can never leave this box. It gives the illusion of being in an infinite grid. So this is a great way to fake an infinite space. Uh, let's add a few more of these nodes. And of course, we can always go back to our grid mask node and change our texture. So we can make the lines thinner. And something else we can do is add diagonal lines to our grid texture. So let's use a math node and we add the X and Y coordinate together. And then we use the compare option. If we set this to 0.5 and here we can enter the thickness and we then add these two together, uh, we get some sort of diagonals, but uh, we can subtract this here. And if we set this to zero, here we have actual diagonals. We can also change the size of them. Currently, we only have the planes in one direction, so they are all horizontal. We could put all this into its own node group, and we could call this multiple grid planes. To change the orientation of these planes, we can just change the coordinate system. So let's separate and combine these vectors. So currently, we have this coordinate system, so we have not changed anything. But we could swap the y and the z-axis, for example, on the ray origin and the ray direction. And now the plane is oriented in the x-y plane. And now we can combine this with our old plane. So we duplicate this plane, just use the ones from before. And we can combine them with a minimum node again. Uh, it kind of works, but they are offset by 0 0.5. So we could try adding a vector mass node and shifting it by 0 0.5. Also this one. Now it's correct. So let's copy this again. 
And let's also combine this with a minimum node. So this would be the default and it doesn't change anything. Let's try swapping the x and y coordinates. And we get now this plane here in the center. But it's still not correctly offset, so we also have to shift the ray origin. Like this. Okay, so we could make the lines a lot thinner again. And we could add a center dot to all the faces. So we have a dot here where the diagonals meet. So let's copy this and set it to add. And then we say if this value is greater than some number, we probably get some kind of dot. Yes. And we can just add them together as before. Let's make this really small. Okay, I think we are done. At the end we can always invert the image. So we have a different style. 